There are false teachers who either intentionally or unintentionally teach stuff that isn't biblical. There's really only one way to know for sure if they're teaching falsely. You listen to their videos, their sermons, their interviews, etc. and maybe read some of their books. In the following interview with Sam Storms on Remnant Radio from the summer of 2022, you'll see how to flip that upside down. Instead of waiting until he has enough information to speak accurately, Dr. Storms will make confident assertions based on hearsay. I don't know Benny Hinn personally. I've heard that he has changed his ways with regard to the prosperity gospel. He's publicly repented of that. Benny Hinn never said, I'm not going to preach prosperity anymore. He never said that. What he did say was he wasn't going to ask people to give a specific dollar amount and then promise them a specific dollar amount in return. Here's part of the video from that talk where he supposedly repented of the prosperity gospel on September 2nd of the year 2019. I still believe in prosperity, but let's look at what the Bible says. The message of prosperity is in the Bible. We, we, we cannot deny that if we give, we receive. We cannot deny God will bless us. That's in the Bible. You can't erase it. No way. God wants to bless his people way more than you ever want to receive that blessing. But when you put a price on it, never. Because it gets corrupted. Now, whether or not that's true, whether or not he's living out, I don't know. Sam Storms heard that this story about Benny Hinn repenting might be true. In spite of that lack of knowledge, he makes a conclusive statement anyway. Now, whether or not that's true, whether or not he's living out, I don't know. I cannot. You guys might know more than I do. I've been ridiculed by several individuals when they heard me say, yes, Benny Hinn is a born-again man of God. Does he have a faulty theology and sometimes a manipulative minister style? Yes, but the man loves Jesus. I'm convinced of that. And he will use a type of thought-stopping device that claims all discernment bloggers are wrong. Why? Because they are. Maybe God is just telling all of us to dial it down a little bit. I mean, especially in this age of these so-called discernment bloggers. I mean, if you, comb, if you part your hair on the wrong side, they're going to tell you you're going to hell. I mean, it's almost that bad. And they're vilifying godly people. I mean, unfortunately, the, the so-called discernment bloggers are doing that very thing. They're, they're just crucifying the body of Christ, and it's, it's reprehensible. Um, I trust that Benny has seen the light of day in that regard and has made some changes. I don't know that. I'm going to play some excerpts from a very recent Benny Hinn video. This is from September 30th of 2023, where Benny appears to be having a how wrong can I possibly be contest with himself. Now, I don't know if you can trust me because I'm one of those so-called discernment bloggers, but all I do is listen to what these men actually teach and actually say. And what they say and teach is really bad. The minute it, it happens, God will look to those who've been faithful to be in line first. How many of you want to be completely prosperous in the coming days? Put your hands up high. See, now you're going to lay hands on the sick and they will be healed, right? It said so, right? So God's going to use you where the healing and will flow through you. So will finances flow through your hands. If you are faithful today, if you're faithful now, don't wait till it's too late. God does not trust late comers. Benny Hinn has invented a new way to generate interest in his dwindling ministry. He's got an insane new theory that predicts the future based on false statements about the past. He throws in a Bible verse or two, and his gullible audience just eats it up. Then 2024 is the year of the greatest beginning of the greatest move of God in the history of the world. And in that move, we're going to see three things. All your loved ones will be saved. It means all your loved ones will be saved in one year. Number two, the miracles we're going to see worldwide are going to happen in your kitchen, in your living room, in your homes. And number three, prosperity unseen, prosperity unknown in the body of Christ. So in this new scam, I mean, this new teaching from Benny Hinn, there are three things he's saying. Number one, everyone will be saved in one year. Number two, everyone will be healed. And number three, there will be prosperity for all Christians. But of course, you got to give your money first to Benny Hinn to prove to God that you're worthy. Benny Hinn asking for money so that you can prove yourself to God so that he will then turn around and reward you with prosperity is nothing new. That's what he's always taught. He never stopped teaching that. What is new is that Benny is teaching that these things are going to happen for sure, prophetically, because there's going to be peace in the Middle East. Israel's going to finally be at peace with its Arab neighbors. 
And Benny has this bizarre teaching that because this peace thing is about to happen, it's going to be a trigger in the prophetic so that the church will have these three things, the last of the three being this great prosperity that requires you to give to him first in order to be a part of it. For the first time, we are going to see these nations come together in peace. I have amazing news for you, but I'm going to wait till you all come on. Prophetic news. This is a prophetic alert that is remarkable. What the Lord is doing is amazing. And I'm so glad you're all coming on. And I'm here to tell you, peace will come between the Palestinians and the Israelis. How? Only God knows. But it's going to have to happen for you know, a short time, even if not, maybe a little longer. This is going to be a global revival because now Israel is making peace with its neighbors. But when the Saudis come in, this will be major because it will end it will bring to an end the Israeli-Arab conflict that's been going on over 100 years. Think about that. This is key, that Saudi Arabia is going to make peace with Israel. They're on the verge, on the verge. Bibi announced it yesterday at the United Nations. I almost came off my seat when I heard him say that. And eventually it will solve the Palestinian-Israeli problem. It will have to because the Saudis are very influential in the Arab world. Everyone listens to them. So Benny told everybody that peace was about to happen and this would prophetically trigger this great revival, this worldwide revival that meant we were going to be prosperous. And if you wanted to get in on that, you better give money before it starts happening. See, now you're going to lay hands on the sick and they will be healed, right? It's that so, right? So God's going to use you where the healing anointing will flow through you. So will finances flow through your hands. If you are faithful today, if you're faithful now, don't wait till it's too late. God does not trust latecomers. I'm going to say it again. God does not trust latecomers. He trusts those who've proven themselves faithful over time. A faithful man means over time he's proven himself again and again and again. He didn't just show up just because he wants the blessing now. A lot of people will, will, will start giving when the pouring begins. It'll be too late for them to even, to even be used. Because God says, no, you were not there. You did not give. When you, when, when, when you had to trust me by faith, now you, you want it because you're seeing it happening in other people's lives. Yes, Benny Hinn is a born-again man of God. Does he have a faulty theology and sometimes a manipulative ministry style? Yes, but the man loves Jesus. I'm convinced of that. We're going to talk about a dream about Benny Hinn that Mike Bickle had in this video. So... <laughs> Benny Hinn. Like, Dive into lob, the deep lob, end. Lob huh? over that softball at you. Now, I can imagine that many of you are already done watching this video. You're already sickened by what you've seen. And I've made my case pretty clearly by just using a handful of clips of what Benny Hinn actually is teaching. But what will happen is that people like Dr. Sam Storms or the people at Remnant Radio or the people who support their theology will say, he just took those little clips and he stuck them together in a way that made things look different than they actually are. I took them out of context. So I'm going to go through this entire video and I'm going to show you in great detail that these men just don't have their facts straight. They're not getting things right. And I want to get to the bottom of things as much as possible. So please watch the whole thing so he had a, when was it? yeah had a dream in 1993 uh which was the year i arrived in kansas city and um mike dreamed that he was on the stage with benny hen uh as you know benny's a very controversial uh minister and mike was actually rather surprised that um that he was on the stage with benny at that time benny was the pastor of the orlando christian center in orlando florida before he kind of went out independently and in the dream, Mike was standing on this platform. There were probably fifteen to 20,000 people in this auditorium. It was a huge gathering. I just want to make a quick comment that um, even though these guys are sitting in the same room and they're talking directly into really high-quality microphones, the audio wizards at Remnant Radio have somehow made it seem like they're talking over the Internet using a really bad connection in 1997. And Benny was standing to Mike's left, and he had his right arm around Mike's shoulder, and Mike was holding a microphone and prophesying. And in the, in the dream, <laughs> this is interesting, in the dream, Mike's thinking to himself, I'm not on John Wimber's platform. Because remember, uh, at that time in 1993, we were Metro Vineyard Fellowship. We were very much a part of the Vineyard movement. And uh, it just shocked Mike that, that he was not on Wimber's platform, that he was actually on Benny Hinn's platform. And he, as far as he knew, Wimber had never... Uh, had any contact with Benny Hinn, and so it just it just felt strange and odd to him. Um, but the most significant part of the dream was that 
while he was having this dream of standing on Benny Hinn's platform with Benny's arm around him, the Lord impressed upon him that when this happens, it will mark a significant time of transition for the church. In fact, if you all are wondering about all the events leading up to the formation of IHOP, this was a very decisive moment. Uh, in the decision that Mike made to step down from leadership of the church and to start the International House of Prayer. In case you're not familiar with Mike Bickle and the International House of Prayer, this practice of telling long, drawn-out stories over and over again about how certain prophetic words led to certain things happening is very common. In these sessions, I'm going to be more telling stories in the spirit of prophetic declarations. Bob Jones first walked in my office. This was a year before this building was given to us. He tells me, you're going to move from Overland Park over to Grandview. Harriest Truman, his property, the Lord's going to give it to you. And I said, I can't imagine that happening. On the Harriest Truman property. On Harriest Truman's property. Stories that are prophetic declarations that touch our spirit, that move us. He goes, uh, uh, are, are you a singer and musician? I said, no. And he said, are you a singer and musician? Again, 35 years ago. And I go, no. He goes, do you ever pray for Israel? And I go, never. Are, do you pray for Israel? I go, never. He goes, number three. He goes, are you connected to Asia? Because you're really. He goes, do you have a connection to, to Asia? Because you're going to have a big connection there. And I went, none. <laughs> he goes, so you don't know anything I'm talking about? I go, nothing. So you know nothing what I'm telling you? I go, nothing. <laughs> then he said, the Lord told me you'd be dull. I didn't think you'd be this dull. <laughs> he said, the Lord told me you'd be dull. I didn't think you'd be this dull. <laughs> no, he did. <laughs> he goes, you're going to pray for Israel. You're going to move on Harriet Truman's property as a sign and a wonder. On the Harriet Truman property that you're going to be on with singers and musicians. In Grandview, on Harriet Truman's property, on unplugged TV sets, even in the rice paddies. I'm going, I'm to, going be to be more telling, more telling stories, stories in the spirit, the spirit of prophetic, prophetic declaration. I'm trying to remember that thing that the Apostle Paul talked about over and over again. Oh yeah, here it is. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So, the years pass. Mike basically... What's he wearing? I, I, I'm going to come back to that. Okay, okay, I'm going to come back okay, to that. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to wrap up that part of it at the end. Okay. Um, so the years pass. About three years have passed. Mike largely forgets the dream. It's just not part of his conscious thought. Now it's October of 1996. He's in Toronto at the Catch the Fire conference, which was associated with the Toronto Blessing phenomenon. And it's Friday morning, and a young man comes to him and says, Mike, I want you to know that Benny Hinn has a conference right now also in Toronto. And he would really like to meet you. Was there any way that you could come with me and come to the conference? And Mike said, yeah, okay. So he kind of slips out of the Catch the Fire conference. And um, he's going to this Benny Hinn meeting. Now, the reason why Benny had wanted to meet Mike, twofold. Number one, um, in the summer of 1996, I was actually at this conference with Mike. He's at the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. Uh, Benny's wife, Suzanne, was at that conference. And she just was mesmerized by Mike's ministry. She loved his message, his focus. And uh, she had told Benny about it. And then secondly, Benny wanted to meet Paul Kane's pastor because he was a great admirer of Paul Kane. Mm -hmm. So that's why they invited Mike to come over to his conference. So they had a little 30-minute conversation before, and they went out front. Benny was on the platform. Mike is sitting on the front row, hour and a half, two hours of worship, which was typical of a Benny Hinn conference. Mike's just sitting there enjoying himself, and suddenly Benny, points, Benny Hinn points at him and says, Mike, come up here on the platform. Mike still hasn't remembered the dream at this point. Uh -huh. He comes up on the platform, and Benny's standing on his left, puts his arm around Mike's shoulder just like it was in the dream. He hands him the microphone, and he says, prophesy. And he suddenly just opens his mouth and begins to prophesy of this hope for coming many times prophesied revival that would sweep across the country and around the world. Um, so at that very moment, as, as Mike is doing that, um, he's starting to remember the dream and he steps off the platform, he sits down and he goes, oh my goodness, you know, the old Yogi Berra quote, it's deja vu all over again. That's what came into Mike's mind. He said, I've been here before. What is this? And he said, oh, of course, the dream, 1993. It happened just as it was it has occurred in the dream. I'm standing on Benny's stage. I'm not on John Wimber's stage. And it felt strange. And the reason was two months before Mike was in Toronto and this happened, we had left the vineyard, our church in Kansas City. We ceased to be Metro Vineyard. We became Metro Christian Fellowship. And so Mike suddenly realizes why he's not on Wimber's stage because we left the vineyard. He's now on Benny Hinn's stage. So 15, 20,000 people in the auditorium listening to this. Now, the other thing about it that, um, that you guys wanted me to mention a moment ago, I'll mention it now. In the dream in 1993, Mike was wearing a leather jacket as he's standing next to Benny on this platform. Mike didn't own a leather jacket. Well, it's cold in Toronto at this time. And this guy says, you don't have a coat here. You can wear mine. And he hands him a leather jacket. Mike puts it on. And he realizes when he's standing on Benny Hinn's stage, he's wearing this leather jacket that he was wearing when he had the dream three years earlier. Did he log this dream? Like, is it written down? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, just to think about the providence of God in orchestrating this young man who had a leather jacket offered to Mike and Mike wearing it. Going back again to 93, when Mike had this dream, he knew kind of intuitively in the dream that it would mark 
a significant transition in his ministry and in the life of the, of the church in Kansas City. We Okay, so as some people are listening, they think, okay, I I was skeptical, and then you mentioned Bob Jones, and I got extra skeptical, and then you mentioned Paul Kane, I got skeptical, but then the stories were so crazy. I felt like maybe ha- halfway convinced, and then you mentioned <laughs> Benny Hinn. Like, what What do I do with yeah. Benny Hinn? I mean, he, you know, Hinn, I've always heard stories about his fleet of Mercedes. I've seen Costi Hinn talking about just the wild luxury that's, that's even beyond what, I mean, it's beyond your average millionaire. It's like what princes, I mean, it's just insane, you, you know? And so people have these thoughts and they think, wait, so Bickle's associated with these kinds of characters, uh, how can I trust this? What would you say? Well, first of all, he wasn't associated. Okay. I mean, if... He went to a meeting. He went to a meeting. And Benny Hinn had invited him. He said, I'd like to meet you. Well, Mike is the most gracious, endearing, welcoming human being I have ever met. Okay, I want you to notice what's happening here. Michael Roundtree says, how can we trust that Mike Bickle is being wise when he's associating with people like Benny Hinn. How can we trust this movement when it has connections to Benny Hinn? Sam Storms answers by talking about the relationship that Mike Bickle used to have with Benny Hinn before he met him and says he wasn't associated. Well, that's true, but then he was associated. Benny Hinn invites him to a meeting and he invites him to come on stage and talk. And Mike Bickle does all of those things. That's what it means to be associated with somebody, Sam Storms. This is almost like if somebody said, hey, um, I know that you robbed a bank and I want to talk to you about that bad thing you did when you robbed the bank. And you say, hey, well, before I robbed the bank, I didn't rob the bank. So, you know, I'm not really guilty of robbing the bank because I didn't rob the bank before I robbed the bank. And then to confuse the topic at hand even more so, Sam says, Mike is the most gracious, endearing, welcoming person I have ever met as if that was the key point of the discussion, whether or not Mike is gracious enough. But Michael Roundtree asked a really different question, and that was, why should we trust Mike Bickle? Since in this story, we see that he is associated with Benny Hinn. Mike is the most gracious, endearing, welcoming human being I have ever met. Uh, to get him to be critical of anybody is, is a sign and a wonder in itself. Uh, <laughs> he really He's just a remarkable human being. So Mike had never met Benny, obviously he knew of his ministry, so he was happy to meet him. So Mike had never met Benny, obviously he knew of his ministry, so he was happy to meet him. I think it's really fair at this point to say that Mike Bickle here is demonstrating a tremendous lack of discernment, and that lack of discernment has only grown. In fact, it's become exponential. Um, and you know, he was a guest, and so he sat through the service. I mean, what's he going to do when Benny calls him up on the stage saying, no, not coming, <laughs> you know? Uh-huh. Except that Mike Bickle could have done that very thing. He could have said, no, thank you. Mike Bickle would have known all about Benny Hinn because Benny Hinn was really at his peak of popularity as a big prosperity preacher. Here he is on his own TV show in 1996, the same year, with Kenneth Copeland. Guess who I have with me today on This Is Your Day? None other than my dear friend, Kenneth Copeland. Come on, give the Lord Almighty a hand of praise. I tell you, I'm so glad he's here. We've been wanting to do this for a long time. I tell you this, and I want to tell the whole world this, because maybe people do not know that you and I have been friends for years. Long time. And I have always loved Ken and Gloria. Most of what the Bible says about faith isn't too clear to most people. And so on this program, really, if we can just discuss that, because the impact it had on my life, I pray it'll have on, on other lives. And in fact, I got your books, I got your tapes. Gloria's book on prosperity shook me up. Praise because God. Because the, the teaching she gave about the Abrahamic covenant. The blessing of Abraham. The blessing of Abraham? People, oh, now you're getting, now, people get attitudes with this. Get over you. I could care less what you think right now about this. Abraham was extremely wealthy. Kenneth Copeland has taught me so much. And he had a covenant with God. Not the, it's not the Jewish blessing, it's the Abrahamic blessing. He gave about the Abrahamic 
covenant mm -hmm. was something I never realized. I never really un understood till I read her book, and I know she's listening right now, but uh, when I read her book on prosperity, I finally began, I finally began to understand how the covenant <coughs> that God made with Abraham affects our daily walk, even to our pocketbook. Oh, surely. I have watched you and prayed and been in your services even when you didn't know I was there. And, and the, the spirit of God and all these things, I just, I, like Smith Wigglesworth of old, just give me five more minutes under that anointing. Oh, I'll, yes, I'll trade you anything. I'm, just five more minutes. It's the most amazing That's thing. Right. Sorry because of your reputation and these things. And of course, uh, again, you know, I don't know Benny Hinn personally. I've heard that he has changed his ways with regard to the prosperity gospel. He's so this story is about what happened in 1996 when Benny Hinn invited Mike Bickle to go to a meeting, and then he invited him to come on stage. And Mike Bickle gladly did those things because he was so happy to meet him. This has nothing to do with the fake repentance that Benny Hinn staged in the year 2019. I've heard that he has changed his ways with regard to the prosperity gospel. He's publicly repented of that. Now, whether or not that's true, whether or not he's living it out, I don't know. I cannot. You guys might know more than I do. So, Sam Storms heard that Benny Hinn had changed his ways regarding the prosperity gospel, but he doesn't know anything for sure. He thinks these guys might know more about it, but they say nothing. But this is not a difficult problem to solve, at all. Do you want to know what Benny Hinn currently teaches? Just go to his YouTube channel and watch his latest videos. That's what us discernment bloggers do. I'm going to show you some videos from Benny Hinn's own YouTube channel, starting with the video he just put out today on August 19th, and then I'll just go back over the last two months. Okay, so this is Steve Kozar here in October of the year 2023, and these clips are still as relevant as ever, but there's a lot more since then. So I'm not going to play all of the clips of Benny Hinn and his false teaching, but it's not hard to find. You just have to look. I'm going to speed these up, too. Abundance is coming your way. I believe that with all my heart. Unexpected abundance. And I'm going to show you from the Word of God three keys that will bring it. Remember, this is not an accident. You have to prepare for abundance because it's coming. It's in the word of God. It takes faithful giving, regular giving to see blessings come our way. A faithful man will abound with blessings. But those who want to be rich quickly will not find the blessings of God. It's faithful, continual giving that will bring the blessings. But I just wanted to remind you of God's promises about prosperity. God will bless you that you'll not worry about your financial future. We will prosper. And Lord, as we're faithful in giving, you said we will abound, overflow. Our Lord, bless them as they sow in Jesus' name. This is the formula for all of Benny Hinn's prosperity messages. God has promised prosperity in the Bible, and you just need to show your faith by sowing into his work. That means sending money to Benny. He doesn't ask for specific amounts anymore, although there are still videos out there that do that. He's a little more subtle now. Abundantly unexpectedly, with abundance. Amen. All right, you can give to the Lord's work. All right, you can sow your seed for the ministry on the platform you're watching me on. If we do, according to God's word, God will always give us the abundance he promised. The Lord estimates our giving by comparing what we give with what we keep. Generous reaping depends on generous giving. Every time we give, we are really declaring our righteousness. Only those who love the Lord give to his work. The wicked don't give anything to his work. God has given every one of us the power to get wealth. God is looking for faithful men, for faithful women that will receive supernatural abilities. You can always make a faithful man able. You cannot make an able man faithful. The blessing of the Lord makes rich and adds no sorrow with it. Now, I can give you promise after promise after promise about prosperity. It's all over the Bible because our covenant right is to prosper. It's in the word. First, believe what God says, that you'll have no lack in your life, and now go inherit what is rightfully yours by working, by doing something productive for yourself. If we don't work, we don't eat, the Bible says. God will bless the work of your hands because he says you'll be blessed coming in, blessed coming out, blessed in everything you do, running over blessings. What did God really promise? Did he just promise no lack? No, he promised way more than that, if we will only accept it. I feel a glorious anointing. I want to pray with you right now that God Almighty will give you abundance you have never experienced in your life. After the Lord will, will so abundantly bless you, he'll open the windows of heaven and pour on you a blessing. You'll not be able to even contain it like it says in Malachi. Lord, give them that abundance you promised in your word. You said you'll come in, you'll go out. Blessed, blessed. Everything you touch will prosper and multiply. You'll lend, oh, and never borrow. You'll be the head, not the tail, above, not beneath. It's your word, Lord, it's your word. 
and let abundance begin to flow in their life like never before. Amen and amen and amen. Okay, it's time to give now. I know your faith has been lifted. It's time to sow seed. The information is on the screen for you now. And I'm talking to you today about your economic destiny because I believe it's God's word and it's God's will to prosper you. You know, he said in his word many times that he wants to bless and prosper you. Prosperity. Prosperity. Okay, it's time to give. And let's show him we are trustworthy. We are faithful. We believe his word. We believe that our economic destiny it's prosperity, no lack. But let's even believe for beyond that. There is a way out of crisis. And it's not by rich getting rich quickly. It's by sowing seed faithfully into the Lord's work. Now I'm going to pray with you. Come on. Let's believe God that God is going to prosper you in a biblical way. And now, Lord, as your people give into your kingdom, into your work, you said you'll give seed to the sower. If you want to be secure tomorrow, there's only one way to do it. And I just told you how. The hand of the diligent makes rich. Be diligent with your giving. Be diligent with your soul. God will bless you, not only with money, but with ideas to make money. And he'll protect your investments when there's a foundation under your life that you're standing in a good place, solid place, believing God's word. Okay, it's time to give. So let's do it right now. The information is on the screen for you right now. And you can obey the Lord and do it with all your heart cheerfully. You can sow your seed on the platform you're watching me on. You can go to our website, benihin.org, or you can text your seed. The, the minute you, you and I will pray, I want you to sow a seed in honor of the Lord and watch what God will do. Because we have to pray first, you know? We pray and then we obey. That's it. Honor the Lord with your substance, with the first fruits of all your increase. So will your bond be filled with plenty because you're walking in covenant. Your prices will burst, out, will burst out with new wine. You're walking in covenant and faith. And now we obey, all is well. All right. Father, come on. Prosperity is not an accident. We obey, God moves. All right, now it's time to sow. We are people of faith because givers are only people of faith. And giving not only enables us to preach the gospel, it blesses you in return financially, protecting your future from the coming harm on the world. Notice Benny Hinn's scare tactic? Give money, Give to, money me, to me and God, and God will protect, protect you from, from all of the all calamity, calamity in the world. world. You see the fear out there. People in Europe right now are worrying about the winter because there's, there's going to be power shutdowns because of the lack of gas, the lack of oil, because of the war in the Ukraine. Now, God's people, the only, listen, please listen to me, the only way you're going to be protected is by giving today, not tomorrow. Your giving today is going to protect you in the future. Givers are blessed and takers are not blessed. And the more you give, the more God gives. The more you give, the more he multiplies. And the more you give, the more God gives. The more you give, the more he multiplies. I don't know Benny Hinn personally. I've heard that he has changed his ways with regard to the prosperity gospel. He's publicly repented of that. Now, whether or not that's true, whether or not he's living it out, I don't know. I cannot... Sam Storms knows nothing about Benny Hinn's repentance, but he repeats something he heard as possibly being true. Meanwhile, Benny Hinn continues running his prosperity scam with more support than ever from the fair-minded and balanced charismatics. And anyone who reports on what Benny Hinn is actually doing gets labeled as a discernment blogger, you know, one of the hateful people that slams and attacks everyone else. See how this works now? You guys might know more than I do. Mike is at the very opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, the stories I could tell you about Mike, he and Diane have lived the most simple, unadorned lifestyle of two incredibly successful people I've ever met. Now he changes the subject to describe the frugal, humble lifestyle of Mike Bickle. That's nice, Sam. But in a few minutes, you're going to basically defend one of the worst prosperity preachers on earth. Does he have a faulty theology and sometimes a manipulative minister style? Yes, but the man loves Jesus. I'm convinced of that. This is an unnecessarily long section of the video where he tells story after story about how humble and frugal Mike Bickle is. Now, I've never heard of any evidence at all that Mike Bickle is making a lot of money for himself, so I have no reason to doubt what Sam Storms is saying about Mike Bickle. 
But here's the weird thing. The International House of Prayer is a public charity and it has not reported a Form 990 since the year 2014, ending in the year 2015, where they showed $5.3 million in revenue. They used to be part of the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability. The next year, they showed a huge increase in donations. Here you can see in the year 2016, their revenue went to just over $23 million. Remember, just a year or two earlier, they told the IRS that their total revenue was $5.37 million. That was the amount of revenue that they reported on their Form 990, which is what goes directly to the IRS. Here's the really weird thing. If you go to the ECFA website, there's a completely different set of numbers, and it's a lot more money. They're showing for the fiscal year ending in June of the year 2015, a total revenue of $24.7 million. That's a lot different than the $5.37 million that they reported to the IRS. Here's their Form 990. This ends in the year, fiscal year 2015, and there it is again. $5.37 million. Yet they reported to the ECFA that they made $24.7 million for that same year. And then about five years later, they resigned from the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability. So we don't know what kind of money they're bringing in or how it's being spent. Now, there could be a perfectly good reason for all of these things, but normally an organization as large and influential as this one should have a lot more data available. Even on Charity Navigator, they said we can't give a rating to this organization because we don't have any information. It's not that we can't find the information, it's that IHOP is not making that information available. And they're doing the same thing in the UK. They just aren't releasing enough information to show clearly how much money is being brought in and where that money is being spent. So the bottom line is coming back to your question, Michael. Um, at that particular time, I mean, Mike has never, you couldn't, you couldn't cram the prosperity gospel down his throat with a promise of millions. He, he just, he, it has no appeal to him. Here's a question that I would like to ask. Bill Johnson loves the prosperity gospel. He loves money. He's really good at making a lot of it for himself. He's even good at hiding it so he doesn't have to pay taxes. I made a whole video about that. There are great men living in the world today. Men like Bill Johnson and Bill's son, Brian Johnson. Oh yeah, and then there's this guy. Lord, we just say Shaba right now in Jesus' name. You were born for glory. You were born to be amazing. I'm not a theologian, I'm a prophet, so I can say things that aren't even scriptural, and you just like, Madria, yeah. Anyway, Bill Johnson and Brian Johnson are great men who know how to make tremendous, mountainous piles of cash. Oh yeah, and uh, this guy, he's making a ton of money too. In 2019, Bill Johnson paid himself $611,117. That was just from Bethel Music and Bill Johnson Ministries. But we don't know how much Bethel Church might have paid him because churches don't have to report that information. Apostles like Bill Johnson hear directly from God and God is telling Bill, make more money. So on top of being the pastor of a gigantic megachurch, he also has his own quote-unquote ministry, which is basically just him and his wife. He goes around and gives speeches. Well, this is their Form 990 for Bill Johnson Ministries. And let's go right to page 7, and you'll see where the money is going in the form of uh, paid salaries. And it's not hard to see what's going on here. <laughs> it's just... Him and his wife. Of course, his wife has passed away this past year, so this will look different in the future. But the two of them combined made $360,573. But let's go scroll down to the thing where they pay other people. And you'll see that they are putting out a lot of money to something called Be Revived LLC. They paid them $333,000 in the year 2019. And if we look at Bill Johnson Ministries for the year 2018, it's pretty similar. They didn't make quite as much, though. The two of them together made $335,000. And if we go down to that same sort of page with the who did you send large sums of money to, you see the same Be Revived LLC, this time half a million dollars. I like money. Surprise. 
the revived LLC is just Bill Johnson and what was his wife. Now it's just him. And it's incorporated in Nevada, where he can save money on taxes. And Bill Johnson not only loves making a lot of money for himself, he loves Kenneth Copeland. This is what I call a preacher's preacher. Come on, give the Reverend another, another welcome this morning. Interest and income. He's got money coming into his place in wheelbarrow loads. Rebates and returns. And I said, and the Lord said, agree with him, agree with him. I said, yes, sir. Checks in the mail, finding money. The Lord's going to get me that money. Debt's paid off. Expenses decrease. And I tell you what, I have just fallen in love with this man. Huh. I am so thankful that we have the opportunity to receive a real believer, a believing believer. And I laid my hands on that airplane and I blessed it. Man, Gaco, Kulele, Shaman on the wings, Banglang, Ganamatoro on the ground, Bro, Bosch, Kulete, Sekle. I blessed the hangar. I just woke. A, a, a man of genuine faith. And I believe that God is going to release over us. In fact, that was the word I got. The, uh, uh, the, a, 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 uh, uh, the, in 2012, that there would be a specific release over this house. I went back down and he said, I got up and went over to the sanctuary and got over there and on my knees. And I said, Jesus, did you go to hell? He said, come right up on the inside of me. Come, come right, right up, right on, up the on the inside, inside of, me. of me. You better believe it, big boy. If I hadn't, you would have. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth Copeland is proclaiming himself to be the wealthiest pastor in America. How is it that Mike Bickle can hate the prosperity gospel, but just love Bill Johnson? Well, Bill Johnson, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Bill, he's a dear friend. I have such affection and respect for him. We have such a great time. We spent hours today talking and laughing and inspiring and I have read his books, watched his videos, stole his material shamelessly, been instructed by the Lord through him, and I love his passion for Jesus, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God for people, his love for the body of Christ, the humility. I could go on and on, but I love you, Bill. Thank you for coming here, because he doesn't travel for Christmas, because there's so much going on world, I mean, year around. But he said, Mike, I'll come one day because I love you. And I thank you for doing that. I want him to know about your new book. I love Bill Johnson because he's a <clears throat> man with an authentic, uh, an authentic walk with God when nobody's looking. And he's a man of courage. That is what I want to esteem and model and be like. Like I said, it may very well be true that Mike Bickle isn't making a lot of money for himself and he doesn't care about money. That's actually a really good characteristic of him. So I'm not doubting that. But I am asking, why is he so comfortable with people who are getting rich off of their ministries? And, and, and yeah, he's just a remarkable guy in that regard. Um, by the way, and very interesting, the only other person I know who is, who is of the same mindset and the same lifestyle is John Piper. He and Mike Bickle, although they have differences theologically, have the same attitude toward wealth and prosperity and money. And John didn't take a penny of royalties from his book. He's made multiple millions. It all goes to subsidize the, the ministry of Desiring God and the church. And yeah. So the bottom line is coming back around. Yeah. Bob Jones, people are going to just think we're crazy that we're speaking in, in an affirming way of him. Same with Paul Kane. Yes, they had their problems. Yes, they love the Lord. Yes, they are with him now. Uh, I'm confident of that. Um, I don't know Benny Hinn personally. I, um, I abhor the prosperity gospel. I'll just be perfectly blunt about it. Um, I trust that Benny has seen the light of day in that regard and has made some changes. I don't know that, but Mike would, Mike would never have said, oh, I can't come on your, up on your platform because people are going to, so they're going to think Mike Bickle is now an advocate of the prosperity gospel. And where um, yeah, that's pretty much the whole problem. You just summarized the entire problem and then made it sound like it's not the problem. Mike would never have said, oh, I can't come on your, up on your platform because people are going to so they're going to think Mike Bickle is now an advocate of the prosperity gospel. So when you go to a meeting, a big meeting of a world famous prosperity preacher and gladly join him on stage, what are you conveying? Are you saying, uh, don't get the wrong idea. I'm not really in favor of this. The point he's making here only makes sense if you start with the assumption that prosperity preachers are simply misguided Christians who have a slight flaw in their theology. However, the cluster of beliefs that make up word of faith doctrine is much worse than that. 
Word of faith doctrine is something that true Bible-believing Christians should mark and avoid. In a nutshell, word of faith teaching elevates mankind into a God and minimizes the true God. Here's a brief clip of Kenneth Copeland teaching outright blasphemy at the Catch the Fire conference in 2015. Notice that John and Carol Arnott approve of this teaching. And yes, it was this same Catch the Fire conference in the 1990s that Mike Bickle was attending when he went over and visited the Benny Hinn meeting going on at the same time. You're not a little like him. You are exactly like him. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, my, my. Whew. You're not a little like him. You are exactly like him. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, my, my. Now here's a brief clip of Kenneth Copeland speaking at the Jesus Image Conference in 2017, which is hosted by Michael Koulianos, the son-in-law of Benny Hinn. Copeland is teaching that Jesus was a born-again man who defeated hell, and he's teaching everyone to duplicate the works of Jesus since we're the same as him. One! 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 Michael, coming back to your point, he's, this, he's, he's an individual who does not um, distance himself from people just because they differ with him on secondary issues. Now, somebody's denying the deity of Christ or justification or penal substitutionary atonement, Mike uh, will stand up and fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best of them. But he's, he's very reluctant to be critical. So, Mike Bickle is very reluctant to be critical, and Sam Storms is too. Got it. Here's my question. Is it possible that this reluctance to be critical has crossed over into being blind to false teachers? Is there ever a time where these guys say enough? Although Sam Storms was very clear about how much he and Mike Bickle hate the prosperity gospel, he affirms Benny Hinn as a man of God. It seems like the only thing that Sam will clearly speak out against is discernment bloggers. As long as you're worshiping and honoring the same Lord and honoring the same book, right. Mike is going to be on your side. You heard it, folks. If you want to scam people out of their life savings or traumatize sick people with false healings, Mike Pickle will gladly look the other way. As long as you hold to some version of Christianity, and of course you love Jesus. Now, I, I want to, the other question about Benny Hinn is more like the from the Lord significance of it. it it's not as, the Lord could have chosen any minister for him to stand with, could have chosen any meeting or any space, but he chose an association with the Toronto Blessing and with Benny Hinn. What do you see in that? How about considering the possibility that the Lord has nothing to do with any of this stuff? Oh my. Good question. I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna let you answer your own question. I, 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 and you, Josh. You I got can, nothing. I, I don't know. Um, Highly speculative response is that maybe God is just telling all of us to dial it down a little bit. I mean, especially in this age of these so-called discernment bloggers. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you comb, if you part your hair on the wrong side, they're going to tell you you're going to hell. I mean, it's almost that bad. I mean, it's almost that bad. And they're vilifying godly people. I mean, you think for a moment, Francis Chan, Tim Keller, um, Russell Moore, uh, David Platt, David Platt, uh, Jack Deere, so many. Mike, of course. Um, no matter, doesn't matter that they believe all the fundamentals of the faith that they're foundationally solid because they have a different view of eschatology or a different view of women in ministry. Suddenly, they are tools and instruments of the devil. The question was, why would God use a connection to the Toronto Blessing and Benny Hinn to help get IHOP started? Sam's answer is that maybe God wants Christians to stop being so mean to each other about secondary issues. This is a bit confusing because just a moment ago he was talking about the prosperity preacher Benny Hinn, but then he mentions Francis Chan, Tim Keller, Russell Moore, Jack Deere, and Mike Bickle as people being treated too harshly. He thinks that all of these people are foundationally solid and shouldn't be criticized as they have been. 
It's true that some discernment bloggers are too harsh, too narrow, or overly simplistic in their approach. But it seems like Sam jumped into a different category when they were just talking about sharing the stage and associating with Benny Hinn. I realize that these guys are just talking off the cuff, so it would make sense that you would kind of jump around a bit. But let's let him finish his thought from here. And I don't know, maybe it's just because I'm growing older and I don't know that I'm, I'm not, my convictions are just as strong as they were, probably stronger. But I'm just seeing the Lord saying, look, folks, as long as we are worshiping the same triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, committed to the truths of the same book. Committed to the truths of the same book. But false teachers are not committed to the truths of the Bible. They just pretend they are. These are people who deliberately twist God's word to enrich themselves. Don't let these secondary issues divide you. Now, does that mean that I'm going to partner with a prosperity gospel advocate? No. No. But it doesn't mean I'm going to hate him. This is a pretty common argument. If you speak out against a prosperity preacher or false teacher, you are guilty of hatred. I made a pretty extensive 21-minute video a couple years ago called Charismatic Conditioning. Here's a little excerpt of that. It's called control, manipulation, maneuvering, wanting everybody to abide by your plan. Man, I hear people criticize leaders around our nation. And I I haven't been quick to confront it, but now it's like, I'm getting serious. Like, are you crazy? Are are you going to bash Rick Warren? Notice how he uses the word bash. If he had said, are you going to compare the teachings of Rick Warren to scripture? He wouldn't be instilling any fear. But he accuses everyone who questions the doctrine of a famous teacher of bashing them. This is a manipulation technique. This is a guy that loves the Lord. Yeah, you may not agree with everything he does, but man, I'm telling you, he loves Jesus. Everything I can tell is everything I can tell is everything I can tell. A supernaturally spirit-filled man. Are you going to attack Mark Driscoll? Are you going to attack John Piper? Are you going to attack Mike Bickle? Are you going to attack some of these expressions in the body of Christ that may look a little... I'm just saying, dude, put that down. I've met these people and I see their hearts and I, and, and I, I hang out with people from these different denominations. I'm like, man, they love Jesus. It looks different from me, but I can see the spirit in them. So you, you, we better be careful. Francis Chan knows these people and he thinks they really love the Lord. So you can just blindly trust them. Wow, that is so easy. Thanks, Francis. As a side note, Mark Driscoll, one of the guys that Francis Chan mentioned, has turned out to be one of the most notorious megachurch, megalomaniac, narcissist pastors in recent evangelical history. They've even made this entire podcast about the rise and fall of his gigantic church that no longer exists, Mars Hill. Are you going to attack Mark Driscoll? Are you going to attack Mark Driscoll? Are you going to attack Mark Driscoll? I've met these people and I see their hearts. Man, they love Jesus. It looks different from me, but I can see the spirit in them. So we better be careful. But it doesn't mean I'm going to hate him. It doesn't mean you won't sit down and have coffee with him. Yeah, and say, hey, let's talk about this. Why do you believe that? And let's look to the scriptures to try to bring some insight and and clarification. Sam, do you actually believe that Benny Hinn, Jesse Duplantis, or Kenneth Copeland wants to sit down and discuss doctrine with you or anyone? Do you seriously think that you could cause these prosperity preachers to give up their jets and mansions by having a friendly chat over coffee? Oh, I mean, you guys had Todd White on the program, and you got vilified for that. Yeah. Right. Speaking of Todd White, here's a video I made a couple of years ago where you can see him really loving Kenneth Copeland and Jesse Duplantis. On July 25th, 2019, Todd White spoke at Kenneth Copeland's ministry and praised Copeland and Jesse Duplantis as men of God. Copeland and Duplantis are perhaps the most notorious and fraudulent prosperity preachers in the Western world. These are men of God. Kenneth, Brother Copeland, is one of the most hated people on the planet. He is. He's one of the kindest. And don't you ever say I did. Most generous. Money! most amazing men I've ever met my whole life. 
And there's so many angry people out there. I'm talking angry. Jesse Duplantis? I met him at a book signing. Why do you need a $54 million private jet? We're not doing any kind of interviews right now. I'm in a book. I just like to know why you need a private Keep your hands off me. You've given away a $20 million jet? So shut up. <laughs> Jesse Duplantis? I love him with all my heart. These are men of God. On heavenly economics. That's right. And how it works. And it works by certain laws of prosperity. That's it. Let me say it again. Prayer is never a verbal activity. It's the self-expression of deity through the concentrated soul. Let me say it again. Prayer is never a verbal activity. It's the self-expression of deity through the concentrated soul. See, the New Testament idea of prayer is that it doesn't originate in man. Every prayer you ever prayed did not originate with you. It originated with God. Now, I want to say that I said this uh, on one of the sessions, and I want to get on this. How many times you've walked by, and you might be shopping, and you see, uh, I don't know, a diamond ring. You like, I can see you like jewelry, right? You like jewelry. Nothing wrong with that. That's good stuff. God's got, the place is, heaven's full of jewelry. Okay. So watch this now. And you think, ooh, man, I like that. Now, the church world would say that's greed. The Bible warns us about the dangers of greed a lot. Jesse Duplantis is encouraging greed. You just want, no, no. God placed that desire in your heart. Amen. That did not originate with you. Yes. That originated with God because he created that stuff and you, his child, he wants you to have it. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. You're not going to understand that yet. I can see some of you going, huh? No, no. Oh, you walk by a car. See, because you've been told so much that that's greed. And you got to, no, no. That's God originating a de delight thyself, therefore, in me. And I'll give you the desires of your heart. You see? These are men of God. And he probably got vilified for it as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but the, your point was not because you wanted to endorse or promote his ministry. You want to get to know the man as a Christian. Why do you believe what you do? Can we bring maybe a little bit of clarification and nuance to some things you've said that are a little bit off base, that are a little bit off base? That's what Christians do for one another. That's right. They don't slug each other and throw each other. Unfortunately, the so-called discernment bloggers are doing that very thing. They're, yeah. they're just crucifying the body of Christ, and it's, it's reprehensible. So, according to Sam Storms, what's the real problem in the church today? Discernment, discernment bloggers. bloggers. The problem of wolves inside the church who lead people astray by teaching false doctrine doesn't seem to exist. And when grifters like Todd White do the fake leg lengthening trick on YouTube over and over again so that they can build an audience for themselves, and then they partner with people like Jesse Duplantis and Kenneth Copeland so that they can get on big stages all over the world, so that they can then pay themselves $625,000 a year, that's fine. That's okay. We just need to sit and have coffee with them and just kind of see where they're coming from. Does that mean that I'm going to partner with a prosperity gospel advocate? No, no. but it doesn't mean I'm going to hate him. It doesn't mean you won't sit down and have coffee with him. Yeah, and say, hey, let's talk yeah. about this. Why do you believe that? And let's look to the scriptures to try to bring some insight and, and clarification. And I mean, you guys had Todd White on the program and you got vilified for that. Yeah. Right. Your point was not because you wanted to endorse or promote his ministry. You want to get to know the man. As a Christian, why do you believe what you do? Can we bring maybe a little bit of clarification and nuance to some things you've said that are a little bit off base? That's what Christians do for one another. That's right. They don't slug each other and throw each other. Unfortunately, the, the so-called discernment bloggers are doing that very thing. They're, they're just crucifying the body of Christ, and it's, it's reprehensible. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, and I don't, I don't know the answer to the question myself, but I, I think about Benny, and even though theologically and in, in, in terms of practice, there'd be certainly things we disagree with. Pretty much the whole world looks at Benny Hinn and sees what he is. He's a con man. He's a guy scamming people out of money. He's a sweet-talking actor. He's particularly good at preying on the weak and the elderly. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Ravenous wolves who don't look like ravenous wolves. They look like they're the good guys, but they're actually the bad guys. Hmm, I wonder why Jesus made such a big deal out of warning us about these wolves who would be working inside the church. 
Here's what happened when a man with a brain tumor was brought on stage to Benny Hinn at the Catch the Fire conference in the year 2014. This man has a, had a brain tumor and he's had prayer, but he feels like the headache has lifted and something is going on. Every with bit of it in the name of Jesus. You know, I just got to switch gears quick in the name of Jesus. You know, I just got to switch gears quick. I want you all to stand real quickly, real quickly. Oh, well, sorry about the brain tumor. Hope that works out for you, but Benny's got some other ideas right now. Have a nice life. Sorry about that. There's a lot of people in that healing line, but I don't think I'm going to have the chance because I got to go. Your giving today is going to protect you in the future. Givers are blessed and takers are not blessed. And the more you give, the more God gives. The more you give, the more he multiplies. But uh, he does have a healing gift. If you could have a miracle, what would you want it to be? That I can walk. Just walk. Is that what you want, Grace? Just to walk? Just to walk. Born with curvature of the joints, Grace Brillat of Fernie, B.C. was just eight years old when we met her at a crusade in Calgary, hoping to be healed by the man known as Pastor Benny. It was something that I focused on for like 18 years of my life. and Focused uh, on it in what way? Just the, the healing and you kind of think, oh, it's going to happen today, it'll happen this time, and that it's going to be, your life's going to change. In Calgary, Grace's mother Janice carried her to the stage, but before long, they were stopped by the screeners who keep the truly sick and disabled away from Benny Hinn. But uh, he does have a healing gift. But before long, they were stopped by the screeners who keep the truly sick and disabled away from Benny Hinn. But uh, he does have a healing gift. Emotionally, it was a little damaging for me. Um, so to go back and, and even just think about it is difficult for me. When you want something so bad, when you want to be made well because you don't want to be in pain anymore, you kind of ignore all of the all of the signs that maybe this isn't right, and that becomes what you fixate on. We caught up with them that day as they fled the arena. Hope of a miracle, even a prayer from Pastor Benny, gone. So when, when he promises, and that's what he does do, he promises that today's the day for your healing, for your mi miracle, and it doesn't happen, you blame yourself. Yes. First and foremost. Yes. I saw the testimony of healing, and I saw the stories about healing, but I never once saw a real healing. It does. Uh, I've talked to Paul Teske, who was paralyzed on the left side of his body, healed immediately on a stage when he was slain in the spirit at a Benny Hinn conference. Um, and I've, I've personally talked with Paul. I've been ridiculed by several individuals when they heard me say, yes, Benny Hinn is a born again man of God. Does he have a faulty theology and sometimes a manipulative minister style? Yes, but the man loves Jesus. I'm convinced of that. The man loves Jesus. I'm convinced of that. So Sam Storms is convinced that Benny Hinn is a born-again man of God who has a genuine gift of healing. He also claims to hate the prosperity gospel and would never partner with that kind of ministry, but he would have a friendly discussion with prosperity preachers to try and help them, since they just need some direction, apparently. Right, so I do believe he has a healing gift. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the Toronto Blessing, uh, which which speaks of revival and and I'm also, I'm thinking about the component of this. So I'm kind of like live in the moment interpreting a, a prophetic word. And, and I don't know, uh, I don't know, bear with me here. But I, I'm just thinking about the fact that part of the word was you're no longer on John Wimber's stage. Well, the reason, according to my understanding, was because Wimber rejected the Toronto blessing. And, and wasn't a huge fan of Benny Hinn. And John Wimber rejected the Toronto blessing and wasn't a fan of Benny Hinn. Hmm. And wasn't a fan so it it was it, it almost seems like in bickle's life to represent a somewhat parting of ways from a spiritual father not in a way of like dishonoring spiritual father but even in a healthy way of just i'm going to explore the fullness of what god has for me not in the sense of embrace prosperity gospel but in the sense of embrace revival when it's messy and in the which really both of those together could kind of represent 
because the Toronto blessing was messy. Benny Hinn's ministry has been messy. No, Michael, my dogs are messy. My granddaughter is messy. Benny Hinn is in his own special category, above and beyond messy. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them, mark and avoid them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. For the report of your obedience has reached to all, therefore I am rejoicing over you, but I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent, and in what is evil. That's from Romans chapter 16. The truth is, there is little distinction between Benny Hinn and the Toronto Blessing. John and Carol Arnott visited Benny Hinn in 1992, and that began the steps that led to the Toronto Blessing in 1994. Here they are talking about it on Sid Roth's program. Very briefly, in 92, you were both very hungry for God, mm -hmm. and you went to a Benny Hinn meeting. What we happened? We did. did. Uh, we did. Uh, we went back to Benny's, and... Yeah. And uh, we've known him a long time, but it, there was a reconnect just being with him. But we saw the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, and about a thousand people come to Jesus. And we said, God, we have to have this. Well, he invited us back into the green room after the meeting. And as we came through the door, he just kind of lunged at us, you know, and just boom, boom, we're down, both of us on the floor. And, and he's saying to me, pick up your wife. And I'm and like, there's no way. She was just completely, completely gone. And so he says, okay, we'll leave her. Well, she just got so electrified. Just <laughs> and I'm saying, baby, just stay under this. Don't yeah. try to get it together. I'll get you home. This is what we want. This is what we yeah. want. Okay. <sighs> this hunger got answered. January 20th, 1994, suddenly something so phenomenal happened, it affected the whole world. Okay, in order to make this video less than 19 hours long, I'm going to move on. But I have made other videos and am in the process of making even more videos that shows the many connections between the Toronto Blessing, Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, Dr. Randy Clark, Rodney Howard Brown. They're all really much closer than they sometimes would like to admit. See, but both of them, there has been a lot of Holy Spirit power in both of them. Yeah. The Toronto Blessing and Benny Hinn's ministry are both messy, but they have a lot of the Holy Spirit's power. This is the problem of modern charismatic thinking. Sure, there's demonic manifestation, scandal, abuse, manipulation, unbiblical practices, and a dozen other problems, but we've got the Holy Spirit's power. We're not like those dead churches. We've got messy stuff that's really cool, like this. Whoa! Did you hear that? You're going to the phone right now, quickly. There's a $1,000 seed. God dropped it in your heart. You knew when I said it that it was you. He was standing there and he had this sex in, the, in his hands and he started to play it over me. The greatest thing you've ever seen in your life. Prophesy over them. And as you pray, God's going to talk to you. And when he talks to you, I'm going to have you come down here and sow a thousand dollars in the Lord's work. To drink, 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 to drink. To drink. Someone started flying in my guest meeting. I mean, he flew out the door. An elephant, a wild elephant. It was radical, 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 radical. Dengrim elo el mango I know you have other plans for it, but God has just changed your plans. More, Lord, more, God, more, Lord. Fill her, Lord. Oh, come on now. <laughs> it was literally raining Skittles candy out of the sky. Just lift it up and bang it. <laughs> Hallelujah! Say ta, yay, say, more, 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 more. Woo, Prithia Pella, many in Socorro Day. 
They're coming here. They're coming here. In the name of Jesus from South America. They're coming here. They're coming here. God said to him, this represents ridiculous favor and miraculous provision. According to what I believe the Lord told me, the president, is going to be re-elected. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Shokorobo se, shatatara se. And when I sold that sacrificial seed, it was $1,000. They're coming here. They're coming here from Africa, from South America, angelic forces, angelic. <laughs> Yeah. Here's what's going to happen. They're promoting this Biden presidency nonsense. This lie from the pit of hell. <laughs> New anointing. <laughs> oh. 100 people. Now, now, quickly, go to your phone. Quickly, there's an anointing. I'm telling you, there is an anointing. Because we won. 110% we won. When they side with us, they're going to say, oh my goodness, he's overturned the election. And they're going to burn everything down. Oh, 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 oh. But, 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 but. Oh, but, but. Oh, God, Shaita is saying, oh, oh, oh. Do not, do not forget Shokoro to share. Your calls, show, 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 show. In, and I want, I'm, I'm, I'm going to press you on this, Chris. In Donald Trump getting his second uh, uh, term of presidency. It has to, yes. That's what I hear. Yes. And so we just th <laughs> thank you, Father, that what was on Smith Wigglesworth's life, let it come on us, let it come yes. on them. He takes the baby, two month old, Throws the baby against the wall. <laughs> you know, because he sings songs of deliverance over us, but I found out that he was playing this beautiful saxophone over me. I can unashamedly and unapologetically tell you right here, sitting in this room car, Joe Biden lost. Walking in as a total stranger, he's about 55 or 60, in overalls, wearing a winter coat, and it was about 70 degrees out. <laughs> The official weather report for that day, March 7th, 1983, high of 51, low of 34. It was about 70 degrees out. <laughs> and but it was, was hot outside. Yeah. The official weather report for that day, March 7th, 1983, high of 51, low of 34. There's no doubt whatsoever he will win because that's God's plan. 100 people right now that are to pick up the phone immediately now, 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 now. God never created Christianity. Man did that. God created Christ. God sold Christ so he could have Christians. <laughs> wow. Oh. Okay. Shaba, shaba, shaba. Delayed response is, brings a denial of a miracle in your life. And he, he, he took it away from his mouth and handed it to me. <sighs> legacy, legacy. Will it be an eight year presidency? Absolutely. Absolutely, we will. Uh, you're sure about that? Yeah, I'm sure about that. Shoko Robo Kototoro, pray. Come on, Sheta Robo. And he said, you play. And I go, Lord, I can't play like that. <laughs> he said, that's because you're doing it wrong. And he says he's going to be in office for two terms. The rebirth of this nation. He said, let me show you. He said, stand up. So I stood up, my wife was still sleeping, and I looked around me, he goes, see all that around you? He said, that's the Holy Spirit and the, the presence and glory of my Father. He said, that's always there. We are going to lift the staff, and we'll command the Spirit, not only to leave, but that he shall not pass. He said, what's wrong is you're not breathing in heaven first. He said, breathe that in first and then blow it through your horn and it'll work out just fine. And you say 10 times, 10 times. Touch. Get that anointed sax, take a deep breath of that golden oxygen and play. 10 times. Ten times. My guest will teach you how to biblically ascend up to and descend from heaven at will. Phil, 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 Phil. And when God's glory fills you, then you'll know. You'll know. You'll know. Yeah, and just coming back around to this issue 
Um, I will stand on any platform in any venue as long as I'm free to preach what I believe the Bible says. Amen. If I'm invited to the Mormon tabernacle Amen. and said, preach what's on your heart, I'm going. Yeah. Except that the Mormon tabernacle is not going to permit a non-Mormon to get up and preach. So this doesn't really mean anything. I'm preaching the deity of Jesus. <laughs> yeah, we're you know? starting John chapter uh, 1, verse 1. And we're gonna work our yeah, way if, it, it doesn't matter whose platform. And people say, but won't, won't that smear your reputation and guilt by association? I said, look, yeah. that's your problem. As long as I'm not hindered in what I can say, if I don't stand on that platform and speak the truth, when will they ever hear it? This is what Francis Chan did. Francis has been, Francis got hammered. I mean, vilified because he spoke at Mike's One Thing conference two years in a row. So in the context of a preacher clearly presenting the gospel in a place that normally doesn't have the gospel, he brings up Francis Chan going to the One Thing Conference, Mike Bickle's One Thing Conference. This really doesn't make any sense at all if you consider that Sam Storms has been defending Mike Bickle as being biblically orthodox this entire time. Um, you know who advised him to do that? John MacArthur. We, when we asked him in our interview, like we, we started talking to him and he's like, well, I asked a couple of leaders. Hey, one of them was me. Yeah, I said, yeah. yes, go. Who, 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 should we go interview? Should I go uh, speak at this conference? John MacArthur told him, well, you'll probably be able to add things that that group hadn't heard before. You know? It sounds like John MacArthur mistakenly thought that Francis Chan was more theologically grounded than he really was. Oops. Francis Chan has basically become an NAR enthusiast who has discarded many of the things he previously taught. He also used the exact same I think Benny Hinn repented of the prosperity gospel, but I'm not really sure thing, a year before Sam Storms did it here. Now here's a uh, excerpt of an interview that Chan did with Preston Sprinkle in May of 2021. He told me there was a chance he was gonna invite Benny. And so he says, do you mind? Uh, I'm about to have lunch with him and some others. Could you come along and just help me sort through this? And so I went, I mean, all I know of him is just watching him on television. Yeah. Obviously just he and I are very, very different opposites in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, but when I was there at the lunch, it was, I'm not exaggerating. It was the most shocking, surprising uh, encounter with a person I've ever had. He goes, I don't know if you guys believe that 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 God can actually lose his trust in you. Um, he goes, but I believe God no longer trusts me. And he's taken the mantle off of me because I got too into my friends, too into money, too into fame. And here's this man just repenting of so many things. And he points to me. Now, he didn't know me because we're in much different circles. <laughs> Just a little interruption here, but how does he know that Benny Hinn doesn't know who he is? In fact, why would he even think that? Francis Chan is incredibly popular and incredibly famous in the entire Christian world. It would be much easier to believe that Benny Hinn knew exactly who Francis Chan was. And I and he says, you, young man. <laughs> and that's why he didn't know me. I'm like, uh, not that young. <laughs> and he goes, God has taken his anointing or his mantle off of me. He doesn't trust me. He goes, but you, young man, he trusts you. I, I'm just sitting there dumbfounded. Like this is the last thing I would have expected from this lunch. And and so I did begin praying for him after that going, Lord, I, you're doing something in his life. I cannot imagine the pressure he must feel from his circle, his world, and everything else. And then when I did see him at a different event in uh, Brazil or some, I don't know, we had a brief conversation, but um, it, it was just, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I know that he's made some public statements about denying the um, prosperity gospel oh, really? okay. and saying it's wrong now and he repents of it. 
But if you listen to Benny Hinn's own words, he never said, I'm not in favor of preaching prosperity or, or I'm done preaching about prosperity. The only thing he said, and he said it pretty clearly, was that he didn't think it was right to tell people to give a certain dollar amount and then promise a certain dollar amount in return. Other than that, he didn't change anything about prosperity. He's still telling people that God wants them to prosper, and he's still asking for people to sow a seed into his ministry so that God will bless them. Now, I already showed a few clips from this video earlier in my video, and then I just want you to know that five days later, he repeated a lot of those same ideas in this interview that he did with David Diga Hernandez. But note, the name of this video is Benny Hinn Renounces Prosperity Gospel, and it's gotten 775,000 views. I will tell you this, though. I believe the Bible. I believe what the Bible says from Genesis 1 to the last page of the Bible in Revelation. Prosperity and the blessings of God are in the Bible. Absolutely. But how do we present it? That's, the, that's what I have to deal with. The people at Benny Hinn Ministries even went through the trouble of taking his very long and often boring videos, and they made these shorts so you can get the gist of his teaching in just a very short amount of time. Abundant prosperity is the opposite of poverty, of want, and of failure. So when we talk about abundant prosperity, it means no poverty, no want, and no failure. What abundance really is, what the Bible means by it, is that you have all you need, plus more to spare. Abundance lifts you and myself above the level of our needs. The Lord himself lived an abundant life on earth. Think about that. He fed the multitudes. Anyone who feeds the multitudes is living in abundance that he can also give abundance. A fish paid his taxes. That's abundance. He did not live with poverty, want, and failure. All his needs were met. The Lord God took care of his son totally, and he lacked nothing. No lack in the life of Jesus. No lack in the lives of the apostles before Pentecost and after Pentecost. God wants you to believe his word. Why? That he might carry out his purpose of fulfilling your economic destiny. And he even talks about how he ran into some young people uh, who live life differently, and it's impacted them. And um, I'd like to think I'm maybe one of those that may have helped out or something. And I'm sure I don't know what he's doing today. Yeah. He may be doing I'm crazy and yeah. asking for all your money. But I'm just <laughs> saying like. So Francis Chan gets to play both sides of the whole issue. On one side, he's saying it seems like he really changed. I'm praying for him and maybe I can even learn something from him. But he also might be scamming everybody. Whatever. Gosh, that was pretty powerful. Um, and I, I am not vouching for anyone here. Yeah. I'm just saying. Gosh, I don't know what else to do than to pray for a person like that yeah. and love someone like that and ask God to continue to reveal things to him and, and maybe even use a guy like that to teach me some things about wow. something I don't know. And I don't know what he's doing today. He may be doing something crazy and asking for all your money says Francis Chan. You know, you could have gotten on your smartphone or your computer and in five, maybe 10 minutes maximum, you could have found out for yourself if he's still teaching this seed sowing prosperity scam. But you didn't. I have a feeling that Benny Hinn's going to be inviting you to a couple more luncheons in the not too distant future. He likes what you do for him, Francis Chan. Prosperity. By the way, my wife and I did a extensive video, a hit the bar video on that Francis Chan interview. I really encourage you to watch it. You probably won't be too uh, surprised to learn that Francis Chan has a problem with one group in particular, discernment bloggers. You know, you go go speak in the same groups that we all speak at. They're not going to hear anything different. Might as well. He like, called John Piper too. John yeah. told him yes. Yeah. Um, so I don't know where I was going with that. Oh, the point simply being Francis has been destroyed on the internet. Francis has been destroyed on the internet. And he, uh, praise God, he, I, don't, I hope it's not affecting him. Francis Chan has been destroyed on the internet? Wow, that's terrible. What kind of mean and unfair things were said about him? Did someone accuse him of crucifying the body of Christ and it's, it's reprehensible? It's nice to have such open-minded and balanced men to help us avoid those mean people who make broad brush statements that just lump everyone into one group and declare them all guilty. I mean, if you comb, if you part your hair on the wrong side, they're going to tell you you're going to hell. But Francis basically said, look, 
if 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 I don't have the opportunity to speak the truth of God's word to these people, where are they going to hear it? Yeah. Wait, is Sam Storms admitting that the people at IHOP never hear the word of God? Is he admitting that the One Thing Conference was void of any biblical teaching until Francis Chan showed up? It sure seems like it. Listen to that again. But Francis basically said, look, if, if, if I don't have the opportunity to speak the truth of God's word to these people, where are they going to hear it? Yeah. yeah. So, by the way, I agree with Sam Storms that the young people attending a One Thing Conference will not be hearing the word of God. I made a video a couple of years ago going over a speech that Bill Johnson gave at the One Thing Conference in 2016. If you want to see a guy twisting the living daylights out of God's holy word, you need to watch this video. I, and I think that all those things are just clearly framed and can't, should be clearly framed. Okay, everyone here at Horrors of Prosperity Gospel, we think that that, thing, that, is, that is false and dangerous and bad for believers. It's a cancer on the body of Christ. Thank you, Josh, for saying very clearly that the prosperity gospel is a cancer on the body of Christ. And what do you do with cancer? Do you feed it? Do you support it? Do you give it some time to figure things out for itself? No, of course not. You cut it out. You remove it. Uh, but again, to be able to, to just oppose those positions and say there are people who have bad doctrine who um, you know, are, are even in a dangerous space that we would endorse. I don't think you'd have Benny Hinn come and speak at your church. Sorry, folks. It looks like we need to use the Remnant Radio audio transmogrifier in order to decipher the words that he just said. We're getting a signal now. Here we go. I don't think you'd have Benny Hinn come and speak at your church, like, but, but you can look from a distance and, and say objectively, I think he finds his justification in Christ and Christ alone. I think he finds his justification in Christ and Christ alone. In other words, I think he's a Christian because he says he is. Or, I think he believes in some version of Christianity, and even though he does wicked things that deliberately violate God's word, he's still a Christian because he says he is. Well, I'll just go on the line. I mean, you all had Randy Clark on your program a few weeks ago. I had Randy preach in my church. Okay. Had some people push back. Wow, he's really covering all the bases. I get to show you a video I made a couple years ago about Randy Clark. Yesterday, I made a video about the impartation that Randy Clark was distributing at Bethel. After getting a lot of criticism on their Facebook page, Global Awakening took that video down. Weird, huh? After telling everyone that the disturbing manifestations are from God, they removed their own video of those very manifestations. Well, now there's a new video that is equally disturbing. Here's what it looked like at Bethel's Healing and Impartation Conference on January 30th, 2020. This is the second day of the Bethel Healing and Impartation Conference in Redding, California, and Randy Clark is imparting something all right. According to Randy Clark's Global Awakening Facebook page, where this video was posted, this is a powerful move of God. Here's that Facebook page. Randy Clark got this fire-burning, painful, electricity-anointing thing from Rodney Howard Brown. And Rodney Howard Brown is still around. In fact, I made a video about him and Jesse Duplantis working together in one of the most horrible displays of bad Christian teaching I've ever seen. Here's an excerpt. This week, get ready for enemies that have come against your life that are going to run from you in stock. Terror. I know somebody's clicking through this and oh, they them prosperity people. Yes. Now I'm gonna tell you something about Jesus. Now don't judge me when I'm gonna say that. Jesus had a little gangsta in him. Jesus had a little gangsta in him. I think Rodney does too, you understand? Because I, I was born with the La Cosa Nostra, with the mafia. I was raised on the streets of New Orleans. You do what you gotta do. My grandpa said, that's what the Mississippi River's for. He said, alligator gotta eat. What are you gonna do? Isn't that funny? Isn't that cute? Jesse Duplantis' grandfather used to kill people and dump their bodies in the Mississippi River. <laughs> and you know, that's a little bit like Jesus, too. But Jesus had a little gangster in him. He had a little gangster in, in a good way. They tried to push him off a cliff. He said, get out of my face. He just walked off. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? But don't get mad at me if I'm blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed going in, blessed going. It's not my fault. 
We are over the top prosperity. Because they always try to divide you. Don't Brother Jesse, they try to divide you. People, people come, they said, oh, Joel Osteen. I said, Joel Osteen wishes he was me. I said, I'm overboard more than he is. They go, oh, you are? Yeah, no. Oh. Let me just tell you a little bit of something about Rodney Howard Brown. This is uh, a man who God has used to spark revival all over the world. Now they're calling us the rich church. Praise God, the wealthy church, the church with 300 multi-millionaires. In. As you speak it out, it shall come to pass. If you grab a hold of this today, you will... So what do you think? Are these just misguided but sincere Christian men who just need someone to sit down and talk a little biblical sense into them over a coffee? No. Okay, I'm going to let the uh, Remnant Radio guys and Sam Storms finish what they were talking about. But remember, I will be making more videos on this topic. It was a wonderful Sunday morning. We had many people healed. who were healed. It was just great. So do Randy and I, interesting, Randy and I did a conference together in the Netherlands. And they did an hour-long interview of us on a couch asking the question, Sam, you're a Calvinist. Randy, you're not. Randy, you're this. Sam, you're not. How is it that you guys can cooperate and collaborate in a conference like this. And we talked for an hour about how we were able to embrace each other as brothers. We love each other, serve the same Lord Jesus Christ, even though we have some substantial differences of theology. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Amen. I think that's that. I think that's that. I think that's that. That's it. That's that. Cool. Well, guys, thank you so much. Okay, this video is already very long, but I do want to recommend that you check out this article, which will really help you think through all of the Bible verses and show you all of the Bible verses that relate to this topic about when is it appropriate to call out false teachers. I don't think that that's being addressed very well in a lot of the church today. And if you haven't looked at this topic before, I think you might be surprised by how much the Bible has to say about this very thing. Okay, thank you so much for watching this very long video, and may God bless you. Bust!